عشر النساء تصدق له قال فجئت إلى ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه فقلت له اذهب إلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فاسأله إذا تصدقت عليك وعلى اليتامى في بيتي فهل لي من أجر فقال عبد الله بن مسعود ابته أنت قال فانطلقت إلى بيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فإذا بلال فإذا امرأة من الأنصار حاجتها حاجتي فجاء بلال إلى الباب فقلنا اسأل رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم هل المرأة أجر إذا تصدقت على زوجها وعلى اليتامى في بيتها فجاء بلال فأخبر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من هما فقال بلال إحدى زيانب فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فأخبرهما بأن لهما أجران أجر القرابة وأجر الصدقة that Zainab, <coughs> the wife of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, she said that I was sitting with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, O oh, women, give sadaqah, walaw min hilli kunna. Give sadaqah even if it is from your own personal jewelry, the jewelry that you wear. Give sadaqah from it. For indeed I saw the vast majority of the people in the hellfire to be women. So Zainab said, so I went home. And I said to my husband, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the famous companion, who was one of the scholars of the Sahaba, but who was also poor. So I said to my husband, <clears throat> go ask the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that will a woman be rewarded if she gives her husband sadaqah as well as the orphans that live in her home? Meaning if she gives her husband and the orphans sadaqah, will she have a reward? Because this was normal and they didn't think that there was anything attached to it other than just a woman trying to do some good in her home. But they didn't know that the scope of sadaqah or the scope of charity could even be extended to the family. Okay, And this is something important for us because many times we just do for our family and we don't really think about the divine reward that is in it. We just look at the immediate reward of keeping the family together and, you know, keeping good family ties because we're doing good with our family. But we don't think about the divine reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is connected to that. So Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said to his wife Zainab, no, you go and ask him. You go and ask him. And it could either be due to the embarrassment, you know, a man going to ask another man if his wife gives him sadaqah, you know, Will she be rewarded? You know, that's embarrassing. Or it could be to due to the fact that Abdullah bin Mas'ud wanted his wife to have that experience. No, you go ask. Go seek knowledge yourself. I know the answer to it. I want you to have that experience of going to the Prophet ﷺ yourself and going to seek the knowledge of what you... What you and this is something also for men to <clears throat> encourage their wives. You know, sometimes our wives come to us with questions and we want to answer the question because we want to be that source of information for our families. You know, you can come to me, I have the answer. But sometimes it's better to empower them by, you know, directing them to go get the knowledge themselves. Go search, go research, go look it up. You know, I know the answer, but I want you to have that experience of going back, having an inquiry or a question about something, going back and researching it for yourself. Because there's something about researching and then actually finding the answer that, you know, that is, you know, it's, it's something of joy that comes to you when you are able to achieve that. So he said, no, you go ask him. So Zainab so, said, so I went to the house of the Prophet Wasallam, And it also shows you that the Prophet Wasallam, he was accessible. He didn't have guards around him. You couldn't come to his home. You know, it was off limits. He was accessible. You know, anybody could have access to him. It wasn't like, you know, like today, you know, you can get in touch with an imam. You know, you have to call and make an appointment to get in touch with the average imam. He has security. I mean, what, what does an imam need with security? I mean, like, who's trying to hurt or harm a religious leader in the community? If he's a public servant, right? 
He's doing a public service to the community. Everyone should love you as everyone loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He didn't walk around with security guards, you know. So she walked to the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when she got to his door, she noticed that there was another woman from the Ansar that was there. She said, Hajatu ha Hajati. She had the same question I had, meaning she must have been there at the beginning, and I believe this was on the day of the Eid when the Prophet ﷺ encouraged the woman to give sadaqah. She had the same question that I had. So Bilal came to the door, and Zainab said that I said to Bilal, go ask the Prophet ﷺ that if a woman gives her husband sadaqah, and gives the orphans that live in her home sadaqah, will she have a reward from Allah? And she said, but don't tell him who we are. You know, don't, don't tell him that it's Zainab, the, the wife of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Here again, trying to preserve the honor of her husband, you know. And, and women should be cautious that when they go to an imam or they go to someone seeking, you know, uh, you know advice about someone, that you try to be as discreet as possible. Try to be as indiscreet as possible. And not to expose and, well, I'm the wife of such and such and I just want to question because my husband, you know, the, sometimes information is just not necessary. Some information is just absolutely not necessary. If you can get the answer to your question without exposing who it is for, then alhamdulillah, khair wa khair. This is it's good on top of good, you know. And so Bilal, went in a, and told the Prophet وسلم, or asked him the question. And the Prophet وسلم, said, well, who are the two women that is asking the question? And Bilal listened to what he said. The Prophet, now mind you, she told him, don't tell him who we are. And the Prophet وسلم, innocently asked, who are the two women asking the question? So Bilal said, Ihda Zayanib, one of the women in the community named Zainab. But he never said exactly which is Zainab. The Prophet Sallallahu had a daughter named Zainab. The Prophet was married to a woman named Zainab. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud's wife was named Zainab. So there was a number of Zainabs in the community, right? And, and that just shows you also that names were common amongst them and they didn't have a problem with it. Whereas today, we were looking for the most exotic and the most exclusive name to name our children because there's so many Aishas, there's so many Abdullahs in the community. There can never be enough Abdullahs. We're all Abdullah. There can never be enough Muhammad. Muhammad is the most, you know, the, the most beloved names to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muhammad is the most popular name in the world today. Michael Hart wrote a book, The Hundred Most Influential Men in the World. And he's a non-Muslim. The Hundred Most Influential Men in the World. And at the top of his list, number one was Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was a Christian. And the reason why he said he mentioned Muhammad before Jesus was because that Muhammad was the most influential man in the world. And they did a study and Muhammad is the most popular name in the world today. Second to, uh, you know, the second name, most popular name is Jack. But Muhammad is the most popular name in the world. There can never be enough Muhammads, enough Abdullahs, enough Zainabs, enough Aisha. So Bilal, on the Allah, trying to, you know, respond to the Prophet, but still trying to keep the amana that was given to him, he said one of the women in the community named Zainab. So the Prophet said, tell her that she will have two rewards. If she gives her husband sadaqa, and she gives the orphans in her home sadaqa, she will have two rewards. Ajrul qaraba wa ajrul sadaqa. She will have the reward of keeping family ties, and she will have the reward of sadaqa. You know, and this also shows you that the women, the Sahabi, they wore jewelry, they wore gold. Whereas men today, you know, it's, you know, we, we make everything haram for our wives. You can't wear gold, you can't wear makeup, you can't wear this, you can't wear this. But then yet and still you find the men looking at all of the women in the dunya that look like that. You tell your wife don't look like that, but then you look at all of the women in the dunya that do look like that. And we need to make our minds up. What is it that we want? You know, what is it that we want? We, we're, we, we have mixed emotions. We tell our wives don't look a certain way, but then we look at every other woman that looks exactly the way we told our wives not to look. The Sahabi, yet they wore jewelry. They wore rings. They wore toe rings. They wore earrings. They wore nose rings. They wore jewelry. Even during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, on the day of the Eid, when he told the Sahaba to give sadaqah, and he went over to the women and told them to give sadaqah, what did the women do? They took off their jewelry and started to throw it in the in the in the thobe of Bilal. Bilal was carrying his thobe like this, 
And the women were taking off their necklaces and their, and their rings and their toe rings and they were throwing it in the dhob of Bilal, giving sadaqah from their jewelry, from their personal jewelry. So the women, they used to beautify themselves, obviously in the home, beautifying themselves in the home, but Islam does not take that away from the woman. And of course that should be done in moderation and that should, be not, that should not be done in, you know, in pursuit of, you know, following the beautification of the kuffar. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa taslimu al-kithira wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.